Okay, so welcome to our workshop today on working with climate data in R. Okay, so uh, let me tell you a little bit about myself. So me and my colleagues work for the UC Ag and Natural Resources. So this is part of the University of California. That's not one of the better known parts. Uh, we are the division that has offices all over the state of California, cooperative extension offices. Uh, what our what our division specializes on is really applied research, and more specifically, applied research for agriculture, for natural resources, for nutrition. It's very hands-on. In addition to those offices throughout the whole state, we have clusters of faculty on about five of the UC campuses. So these are faculty who have co-appointments uh, with the department as well as this, this division. And we have some field stations, research and extension centers, and a bunch of these statewide programs, some of which you've probably heard of, such as 4-H, it's a very popular youth program, um, but we also have um, IGIS, and that's the group that I work with. Um, and I'm here with my colleagues, you'll see them in, in the participants pane, uh, Robert Johnson, Sean Hogan, and Shane Fire, uh, we're all part of this little, we're basically a little GIS support unit for this whole division of um, ag and natural resources. I also want to shout out, give big shout outs to other people. Most of these people are with the CalAdapt team uh, based at the UC Berkeley, but CalAdapt is for, it's a project for the entire state of California. Um, I won't read all the names here, but really a big thanks to, especially to Brian Gailey. Uh, Nancy Thomas has been a big help. And then uh, Maggie Kelly is our director. And then Ben is going to be one of the uh, our helpers today. So Ben is also part of the IGIS. The funding for CalAdapt and this project has come from the Strategic Growth Council. And then the California Energy Commission, of course, also uh, needs to be recognized. They provided the bulk of the funding to develop CalAdapt. And all CalAdapt is run out of the Geospatial Innovation Facility on the UC Berkeley campus. Uh, about you people. So almost 60 people signed up for this workshop. And as you can see in the little pie charts here, almost all academics, which is expected. This was advertised through UC uh, Love Data Week, a few others. Here's the distribution of people from the different campuses. So nice spread. It's good to see really all of the um, 10 UC campuses represented. Uh, climate change science is new to everybody. Um, at least us old, old folks. So most of you are a little bit of familiar with climate change data and climate change science, um, and then a few uh, with more experience and a few just getting into it. But you're welcome here. We will do a little review of climate change data that we'll be working with. Uh, most people are familiar with R at least a little bit, so that's good to see. Um, those of you who are just getting started with R, um, I'll try to speak uh, quickly, uh, you know, about what we're recovering, at least enough that you can run the code that's that's ready to prepare. Um, so hopefully that'll be smooth. And then this is where folks are coming from, right? Obviously, about half and half between Northern and Southern California. Um, so that's it's always interesting to see where people are coming from. Okay, so great representation here. So what are we going to do today? My hope is that by the end, of, by one o'clock, if you stick around that long, you will definitely be more familiar with CalAdapt R. So this is an R package that allows you to work with climate data from CalAdapt in R. And it makes that process a lot easier, both to import it, and then we're gonna see lots of examples of what you can do with it once you get it into R. So we're gonna have a fair bit of hands-on practice using the functions from that package to bring climate data into R through the API. I'll talk about what that is in a minute. A lot of what we're going to see today in the hands-on exercises are is what I would call data ranking. It's not so much getting the data into R. That's relatively easy thanks to this package. But we'll see lots of examples of how you can wrangle it to make plots of different types, prepare it for an analysis, and so forth. And then we'll see. Um, I don't know how much we'll get to, but we, there are the package does has some functions which are specialized for dealing with large volumes of data. But really, the output of today, whether or not you remember everything, you should definitely have code recipes. 
So you, you will have these notebook files, which will have functioning snippets of R code that you can save and you can come back to. And so that's kind of the idea here. Um, so we're going to go through, you know, I'll cover the concepts, we'll get the code recipes, you'll get some examples, and then hopefully this will get you um, moving up the learning curve to, to working with climate data in R. Okay, any questions? Excellent. Okay, a little bit about Caladap. So Caladap is a data portal and a website for downscaled climate data for the state of California and bits of other neighboring states. So this is official peer-reviewed data. It has been endorsed by the state of California. Specifically, the data that's on there now is from the fourth climate change assessment, which was three or four years ago. So the data sets have been selected with guidance from the California state agencies. And there's a big report and lots and lots of uh, academics and agencies um, were involved in that. Here are some of the highlights of the different data sets on Caladapt. Uh, there's temperature, precipitation. And again, this is both projected into the future as well as historic values, both observed historic values and modeled historic values. We'll talk a little bit about that. So you can see it's the usual suspects that you get out of climate models, you know, your temperature, precipitation, um, things like uh, snow water equivalent. There's also a number of sort of derived variables, right? So that you can, um, that are based on these climate values plus models that include land cover and things like, you know, wildfire risk models and so forth. So it's a bunch of different stuff. Uh, over 950 data layers are on there now. Right? Most of these are rasters. There are a few data sets such as um, Streamflow, which are not rasters. These are like point data sets, and those you cannot work with in R, at least not through this package. Okay. Um, if you, I'm not going to go on every link here. There's a link here if you want to see a list of the, the data layers. Here is the area of the, of the raster data that is covered by these downscaled climate data. Okay. okay, so where exactly are these data living? So they've all, where did they come from? So they were all developed through a set of processes in the fourth climate change assessment. They are saved as raster files on servers. And then how do we get to those data? Right, so this, there is an API, which is kind of like a language that computer programs understand, and that feeds, that's a way to get to most of the data at the Caladap website, which is a great website, uses that API. Um, this, the package that we're looking at today will use that API, as well as a Python library that my group has also developed within the last year, I'll talk about that in a minute, also uses the API. In addition to that, there is an FTP server. Right, so if you want to get the source data, the big H, um, uh, net CDF files, you can get those through FTP. But that's the big, the, the, that's a lot of data, and the API makes it easier to get just the data that you want. I'm not going to go through this whole table here, but it shows the ways that you can get to the data that are on Caladapt is through the website, that FTP, and then the Python and R libraries that have been developed within the last year. I'm going to just focus on Caladap R. What I will say here is that you can pretty much get everything except for all of the 32 GCMs. So basically, GCM, that's a global climate model. Those are the big models that are run in supercomputer centers around the world. Um, there's 32 out there that are recognized and peer reviewed. 10 of those are available through the API. Uh, those are the 10 that were recommended for California. So those are, and that's, that's, they're a good representation. But other than that, you can get most of the types of data uh, through the Caladapt R package. The Python package, I, I'll give a shout out to there. Um, Shane Fryer, who's with us today, he developed that package. Uh, it's a great little package. Um, maybe we'll, we'll put a link to the website um, uh, in, in a little bit. There's also in the slide deck on working with large data. Uh, there's some more information about the Python library. There is a workshop that Shane did from November, if you're interested in learning how that works. 
uh, and the recording of that is online. And he's actually teaching a version of that workshop tomorrow, if you are uh, able to sign up for that. Registration for tomorrow's workshop is full, uh, but you can get in touch with Shane for more information. Okay. Um, this is a link to a very nice webinar that the Caladac team did um, a couple years ago on their uh, how, different ways to work with the climate data. So why would you want to do this in R, right? R is not the easiest program to use. Well, um, if you've ever worked with climate data before, as you know, there's a lot of it and there's a lot of diversity. It's a little bit like um, drinking out of a fire hose, as the graphic here shows. So just R, it gives you the ability to kind of tame some of that and work with the data that you, that you just need. Another big reason though, is that for most of us, we're not really interested in how temperature is going to change, right? That's the climate variable. Generally, people are interested in like, what is the impact of that on something else? So we need to convert statements or trends about climate variables into something that's more actionable, right? So we might know that the daily maximum temperature is going to change over time, but probably you're more interested in something like, how is that going to affect species? Or how is that going to affect um, infrastructure or human health or agriculture, right? So you need to do more than just get the values um, to answer those kinds of questions. R is very strong at visualization, so you can use it to make custom visualizations, maybe a map um, that shows to, for your specific use case. Oftentimes you want to integrate climate data with other types of data, such as census data or biodiversity or habitat or niche models, economic data and so forth. R has thousands and thousands of really excellent, well-developed packages. It's got a great ecosystem, so you might be able to use those for your, for your work. Uh, you might be making your own custom model, or you might want to make a decision support tool. And we're going to see R Shiny, which is a nice little R package that helps people make decision support tools. Okay. We shall keep going. Stop me if there's any questions. So how does this R package work? So it's really, it plays a very small but significant role. Caladapt is a classic API client package. Basically, it gives you user-friendly, well-documented R functions that use this API from the Caladapt to communicate with the server and bring data into your R environment. That is all it does, right? It doesn't do the analysis for you. It doesn't tell you how to use it. But it gives you functions that we shall see to create an API request object and then feed that object into a function that fetches the data from the server and then it's done right at that point. You can turn to other R packages to do the next step to wrangle it to analyze it to visualize it and share it right. So its main job is to provide functions for querying uh, that's where you get back values for your location of interest. Um, into R through the API. Okay, uh, as you shall see, it's relatively new, so it's you know it's tried to adhere to a lot of the more the, the common R standards using pipe friendly functions and so forth. Very standard data classes, tibbles, which is the same as data frame, SF objects, and stars are supported. Uh, the units are encoded, and and so on and so forth. Okay, so you can use this package to get climate values from any of the 950 plus raster series on Caladap through the API. You can query your location with as a point, say, give me, I want the, the values for this specific location, point location, or polygons. So you can provide your own polygon object as a simple feature data frame. You can also query the preset areas of interest. We'll see those in a little bit. That's things like counties and watersheds, boundaries. Those ones, you don't have to give it a spatial object. You just have to give it the FIPS code for a census track. And the Caladap server knows where those are. And you get your data back as tibbles, which are data frames, or rasters. We're not going to talk about rasters today, but um, there's a lot of help files about that. OK, so like I said, it's not going to help you. Um, it's uh, you know work with the data in R. You still need to use other packages for that. You know, you do need to know what data you want. That's half the battle, actually, climate data, because it's not very intuitive. And we're going to talk about you do need to know how to, you know, work with climate data in a, in a responsible, wise way. We'll talk a little bit about that. Okay. 
Here is the workflow. So basically, what is your area of interest, right? You have to specify a location. If you want climate data for that entire ginormous region, you know, just use the FTP server. But if you're going to use this, you know, find a specific location. That's kind of the niche of, of the API. You create an API request object. That's a little bit like filling in an order form. You feed that API request object into one of the functions that fetches the data from the server, brings it back into R. At that point, you can start using other packages and other functions to get the data into the proper shape and form for your analysis or for your uh, visualization. And that's things like sorting, joining, maybe reshaping columns, all and that kind of stuff. And then you go on with your work. Okay, we'll see a quick example and then we'll very quickly be looking at a uh, notebook. So first thing you do is you load the package. This is uh, with the library function. Um, that's very standard. What I've highlighted here, this is an example of defining an API request object. So as you can see, it's a set of functions that are joined together with these pipe characters at the end of each one. In each of these functions, you kind of mix and match the functions to get the data that you want. Uh, the first one you can see here specifies a location. In this case, it's a point location, a single point. You can ask for multiple points. Uh, and then you can see some of these other functions. What are the climate variables you want? Tasman and Tasmac is daily air temperature. What are the global climate models that you want? Talk about that in a little bit, but um, you have to know there's there's 10 of them that you can get. The first four of those are the climate models that have been recommended for California as the priority models um, for, the, for the climate change assessment. Your emissions scenario, right? The If you're talking about future model climates, there's a sort of two emission scenarios, kind of a, um, a medium emission and a high emission scenario. And then if you're trying to get historic data, there's a historic emission scenario. So you specify that. Uh, do you want these daily values to be averaged by year, for example? So instead of that, that's generally a good idea because uh, daily data is a lot of data. And usually you don't need daily data if you're just interested in say annual trends and then your dates. So we'll, we'll see a lot of examples of that when we get to the notebooks. So now we have defined an object. This one's called cap one. If you enter it at the console and hit enter, it'll spit out what, what it contains. There is a pre-flight function that you can do. just do some basic error checking. Is the location in the right area? Are the date range proper? So I'll check various things on that. You can plot your API request objects. And that will pull up uh, throw up a little interactive map um, that just to kind of verify that really is where you think it is. And then you feed that function into you feed that object into a function that fetches data from the server. Um, the one we'll use mostly today is called CA underscore get vowels underscore TBL for Tibble. And what you get back is a uh, data frame. And then here we're seeing what that data frame looks like. This is pretty typical, right? So the first column, um, this will be the location ID. And then other columns that tell you each, basically each row in the table represents, in this case, a specific year, a specific mission scenario, and a specific um, GCM, right? And then the, the final column are the units. You can see here the values of this one are Kelvin. So the data come down. So we'll get we'll get practice with that. Um, okay, and then finally we've talked about the uh, preset areas of interest. There's about eleven of those that you can work with. Um, and so if you don't want to find your coordinates of the locations, if you're working with these types of um, polygon areas, you can simply specify them by name. You don't have to pass a spatial object. Um, we'll come back to this. I think we're going to do that in the next notebook. Okay, so that's a quick 10 minute introduction to CalAdapt and climate data. Um, I want to get to the R notebooks, but I'll take a breath. If there are any questions? Okay, so. 
let's talk about our notebooks because we're about to, about to do some coding. So if you haven't worked with our notebooks before, in our studio, our notebooks are a markdown format. And markdown files are a lot like scripts. They basically contain a lot of R commands. That's the heart of them. But unlike scripts, they have other stuff too, um, including, uh, you know, these like that little hash character. That means that's going to be like a, a heading when this is saved as HTML and so forth. The commands, the R commands are in these little gray boxes, which are called code chunks, right? So everything else is not an R command. The only commands will be in these code chunks. And the way you work with an R notebook is you basically from top to bottom, you, you click in a code chunk and you hit the run button here, or you hit control enter to run, to run the functions in there. And then it will spit out the output if that code chunk produces an output such as a plot that will appear below the code chunk. So it, it works pretty well. I, I don't use these for my day to day work, but I use them a lot in workshops. The nice thing about our notebooks is that every time you hit control S, every time you save it, whatever you've already run will be in the background rendered as a nice HTML document. And it's those HTML documents that you can download at the end of today and save them and keep them keep them handy because when you as you'll see um, they have all of the code that you've run. Okay. All right, we'll come back to this. Um, yeah, so just remember that you get these nice HTML files. It's different than a um, other, like an HTML document. It's only going to the HTML file will only have the code that you've actually run. So it's a little bit different. It's not going to run them all at once, but there's a command where you can run all the code chunks at once. Um, and just an FYI, this is a this sort of can't find a path dependency. This is a cryptic error message. Uh, our studio has gotten a lot better, um, but this is one I still get fairly often. So if you get this, um, just clear your knitter cache. Um, and, then, and you may have to restart our studio, but usually clearing the knitter, knitter cache works. Okay, so let's get started. And we're going to go to our first notebook here. <clears throat> okay, so Susan makes a good point. Um, the project folder uh, on our studio does not have a copy of the slides, um, but let's pin that for right now. Um, and I'll explain how to get the slides when we're done. Okay, so in the first notebook, we're going to basically do a very simple query and we're going to create a time series graph. If you get stuck, throw your questions in the chat window. Um, if you get really stuck, uh, and if there's a quick one, I can let you share your screen. Um, we will take breaks, probably take a break at the, the top of the hour. And if you're really stuck, we can do a breakout room then. Okay, so. I'm going to go to, so these various links that you see in the slides to notebooks and their solutions, these will take you to the, H, the rendered HTML versions of these notebooks. So, but we want to run the notebooks in our studio. So go into our studio. And so everybody pull up our studio. I assume you have copied the workshop project. I'm doing our studio cloud. Uh, for those of you who are doing our studio on your laptop um, we'll help you the best we can but um uh, and it, it should be identical to working with our studio cloud i really like our studio cloud i've been using it a lot lately um so here i'm in my r studio cloud if you haven't used our studio much you know basically there's four big panes up here we're going to be working with the upper left pane. This is the script window. This is where we're going to open up our notebooks and run the code. And then below that is the console window. And that's where uh, the output will, will appear. Okay, but go ahead and click on the files pane, which is in the lower right, and then click in the notebooks folder, and then click on nb one getting started at RMD. Okay. okay, I'm going to pause there and maybe um, put your thumb up on your Zoom uh, reaction 
if you've managed to open up this RNG file. If you're having some sort of awful problem, you could put another reaction icon. But okay, it looks like most people are managing. Okay, we'll keep going then. Okay, so here, welcome to our first notebook. So it's just an R markdown file. Um, for anyone who's used R, even moderately, you probably worked with markdown files before. They're, they're quite popular. It's a good way to combine your, uh, to do your work. And I'm just going to kind of read through this. You can go at your own pace if you'd like. Um, but then most, a lot of this is just sort of background material for that will be helpful when you look at the HTML file um, down the road. So I'm going to come down to the first code chunk, chunk one, which starts on line 24. And as you can see, I'm going to close my console because we're not really going to be using it a whole lot. So chunk one, it's a bunch of library functions. And again, that's simply loading packages into memory so that we can use the functions from those packages. So I'm going to click the little green arrow that says run current chunk and that's going to run all of the functions in that code chunk okay and you saw that little progress bar down there so that just showed that it was running them um, if you got any errors it means that you have a package that is not installed that's probably what's going on there okay um, but this should work for everybody if you're using this R Studio Cloud image. Okay, so I will. The next code chunk is code chunk two. Uh, this is loading. This is kind of like setup stuff, right? So code chunk two is using the conflicted package, which is a package that will help you uh, avoid main clashes, right? So there's some functions in R like filter, count, and select. These are very generic function names. And there's multiple packages that have functions with these names. We're simply telling it when they see one of these functions, we want it to use the one from dplyr, right? So we're going to use dplyr. Go ahead and run code chunk two. That should take a second. Uh, code chunk two simply um, is telling it to use the, the dplyr function. So I've already got this path dependency. To be honest, you could ignore that because I'm just going to clear my knitter cache. And, um, do that again. What is the error at the top? So, uh, so the arrow in the little yellow box that says error creating notebook path for HTML dependency. Um, I don't know the cause of this error. It's it's something with the temp space if you have multiple projects, but you can just click the little X box, make it go away. It's only going to affect the rendering of the HTML page. So it's not something we really have to worry about, but you can clear your knitter cache and to clear your knitter cache. Uh, go to the preview drop down. Menu and at the bottom there it says clear knitter cache. And click yes. <clears throat> okay apologies for that yeah I. Um, it's it's a bit frustrating but okay so. Anyway, continuing now, in part one, we're going to get some temperature data for a point location, and we're going to produce that little graph that you see, um, you should see it embedded in the notebook, right? So let's keep going down. So now I'm on chunk three. So go down to chunk three and, and run it. Go ahead and click the green button there. You can also do Control Shift Enter. That will run all the code in a code chunk. You can run Control Enter if you want to run them line by line. Uh, a common gotcha with notebooks is that if you forgot to run a code chunk up above, then you're very likely going to get an error. So in, in those, if you find that, then you can. There's another little button that says Run All Code Chunks Above. So feel free to use the run all code chunks above button uh, if you need to catch up. But let's look at code chunk number three. You can see what's going on here. We're basically creating 
an API request object. We're giving it a location, that's the first function. Then we're telling it which of the global climate models to use, the first four. We'll see the names of those in a little bit. Uh, what emission scenarios, so RCP 4.5 and RCP 8.5, those are the names of the two future emission scenarios, right? The medium and high emission scenarios. Fortunately, we don't have a low emission scenario for the future when the planet is not there yet. Um, the next is telling it what uh, we, that we want this daily temperature data to be averaged by year, so we don't get quite so much. The start years and end years, and then finally the climate variables that we want. In this case, minimum daily temperature and maximum daily temperature. We could have asked for precipitation or snow water equivalent and so forth. The order of the functions does not matter when you're constructing an API request. Okay. As long as you pipe them together and they're all there by the end, you're in good shape. Okay, um, one thing to remember, if you are specifying location by a point, pass it uh, longitude, then latitude. Um, in decimal degrees. Um, and we're going to see examples of other ways that you can build an API request object if you want another, a, another kind of climate variable. Okay. Okay, so that brings us down to challenge one, which is not really a challenge, but it's a prompt to, you might figure, you might think to yourself, GCMs, I, I can never remember what those GCMs are. They've got funny names, like what climate variables, like how am I supposed to know that Tasman means minimum daily temperature? So the package has constants. So go ahead and chunk four and type GCMS, GCMs, and hit enter or control enter. So GCMs is a constant that comes with the package. As soon as you load the package, you can use it and it's got the names of the of all of the um, GCMs that you can access through the Caladap API. So you can see the first 10 are, are the ones that come out of the climate modeling community. And then there's some ensemble GCMs, which some of the data layers use. We'll talk about how to explore the data catalog soon. Okay, likewise, um, there's a constant called scenarios. So type in scenarios, hit enter, and you see the names of, that you can use and those functions of the different emission scenarios. CVARS is another constant. That's the name of different climate variables that you can get through the API for downscale data. And then finally, periods is another one. These are the temporal aggregation period. And when all of the data starts out at daily, but you have the option of having it aggregated on the server so you don't have to do that work yourself. So these constants can help you construct your API request objects. Now that being said, it doesn't mean every GCM and every climate variable and every temporal aggregation period is going to work. It'll tell you, you might want snow water equivalent by month, and maybe it's not available that way. Right, so not saying every one, but we'll, we'll, we'll talk, we'll look at the data catalog um, soon. Okay, questions. Okay, let's come down to chunk number five. So scroll down to chunk number five and run it. There's a single command there. It's simply the name of the API request object that we created above. And when you run it, it spits back what is inside that API request object. So this is how you can kind of see what's inside an API request object. Chunk number six, scroll down to chunk number six, run, run the whole thing. It's basically doing the same thing. I'm gonna get that little error message again. This is annoying. And so what chunk number six is seeing, um, it's basically, specifying the color scheme that the Caladap R package will use when presenting your input. So I'm, a, I'm on a um, R studio where I'm not using a dark background like I usually do on my desktop, I'm using a light background. So you can set, you can change um, if you want 
CA settings function. So console colors equals light, L-I-G-H-T. Um, you can run that and then it just changes the colors that appear. That's a convenience function um, to make it a little easier to see. Okay, let's keep going. So what we're doing now, we're just looking at what's inside this API request object before we actually use it to fetch some data. Chunk number seven, scroll down to chunk number seven. As you can see, this is the pre-flight function. So we're taking the API request object, we're using the pipe operator to feed it into this um, pre-flight function. And it's just doing some error checking um, to make sure we didn't um, ask for data that doesn't exist or ask for data for an area that doesn't exist. Chunk number eight, scroll down to chunk number eight and hit control enter or the little run button. And you should see a little map pop up, a little leaflet map that you can scroll in and out. It's just verifying that the location of that API request object is what we are expecting. Chunk number nine, run chunk number nine. It's the same thing, it's the plot command, but it's adding an optional argument, which is loca grid equals true. So if you go to chunk number nine, you'll see that extra argument. And that is simply showing you the downscaled local grid cells in and around the area of your area of interest, right? So local downscaled grids are about six kilometers um, by six kilometers. Of course, with a point location, you're, you're just gonna land in one of those. Um, but if this was a polygon location, you would see roughly how many local grid cells are gonna be um, collapsed. Okay, um, okay, we'll keep going down. Where is this point located? Well, you can just see it's a little bit north of Bakersfield. So we'll, that's a, that's a softball. <laughs> we'll, go. we'll keep going. Okay, now we've created an API request object. Come down to chunk number 10. And this is where it's actually gonna communicate with the Caladap server. So go ahead and run chunk number 10. Quiet equals true is just simply suppressing the, the progress bar. Um, usually you would see a little progress bar that comes out funny in the HTML file. So I've turned it off here, but you can, you can say, you can remove that if you wanna see that. And basically we're taking the API request object, feeding it into CA get vowels, and we're getting back a tibble or a data frame. The head function shows the first six rows uh, displays those and you can see what we got back it's, it's what we expected if you want to see how many rows are did we get back instead of head you could do maybe dim for dimensions and that's telling us we have 816 rows in this tibble in eight columns right so you could do dim or n row something like that Okay, very good. So we got data back. We're more or less done with the Caladap R package. Let's do a let's go through a couple dplyr functions to get this table ready to make a, a line graph. So chunk number eleven. Scroll down to chunk number eleven and run it. And basically, what we're doing in chunk number eleven is we are. Um, you can see that filter function, right? So we're using dplyr functions right now. Um, if this doesn't look familiar to you, um, don't sweat it. Uh, maybe at a, at a high level, try to figure out how it's working. But filter is basically taking that table and it's filtering out some of the rows. It's only, we're only keeping the rows where the scenario equals to RCP 4.5 and the variable is the TASMAX. And then the mutate function is creating a new column. And specifically, this new column is the temperatures in not in Kelvin, because Kelvin's not very intuitive for, uh, for most of us, but it's converting the Kelvin into Fahrenheit. So if you scroll over, you will see a new column at the end of your table. It says temp underscore F. And that magic is being done with the set units function, which is from the units package. Right? So you don't have to remember those conversion functions. Okay, let's keep going. Come down to chunk number 12 and run chunk number 12. 
chunk number 12 is uh, throwing up a plot uh, using ggplot. If you're new to ggplot, um, it takes some getting used to. It's a very popular, very common and powerful plotting package. I'm not going to try to talk through it here, but as you can see, basically we're plotting as a, as a line series. Um, the temperature values for RCP 4.5, which we had filtered out above. Okay. Yes, you can use degrees. Um, yeah, if you prefer centigrade, you can do that as well. Um, if you have questions about units, do question mark set underscore units. That'll throw up the help page for the that function from the unit package, and you can see the whole list of, um, of units. There's a whole bunch of them. Okay. Um, other questions. All right. So let's. I'm going to pause for five minutes and give you a chance to do challenge number two, which is should be fairly simple, right? We just created a line series for RCP 4.5. The data that we got includes RCP 4.5 and 8.5. So your task for challenge number two, which is down in chunk 13, is to write some code or copy paste and adapt the code above to create a line plot for 8.5. Okay, there is a link to an answer. Um, you get stuck or you just don't have the patience to do this. In our studio, I think if you hit shift and click, you it'll open up that link in a different tab. So if you want to yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna pause for three minutes and give people a chance to try to do challenge number two. And if that's easy peasy for you, you could go on to challenge number three. Okay, let's, um, let me just finish this up. So uh, I'm not even going to type in the answer. I'm just going to click on this link here and you can see, I'm going to cheat and get the, uh, the solution to show. So make sure this works. All right, so hopefully everybody managed to um, modify the code that we looked at earlier to generate a line plot, a time series plot of emissions or temperature under emission scenario RCP 8.5. Okay. Um, challenge three, I'm gonna, we're not gonna do it right now. I'm gonna skip it. Again, there's a hint. The hint is basically, um, so it's asking you to do the same kind of plot, but looking at historic model data from 1950 to 2005. So, Obviously, you're going to have to change the dates when you make your API request object, but you're also going to have to change the emission scenario, right? Because RCP 4.5 and 8.5, those are future emission scenarios. If you're trying to get model data from the past, you have to use the historical emission scenario. Okay, so when you're done, click Save. And when you click the Save button, um, and again, if you get that path dependency not found error message, that little yellow box, just close it, clear your knitter cache and save again. But now if you look in your files pane, you will see a new HTML file. And if you right click, if you click on it, and you can say open in web browser, uh, it should open in a web browser and all the code that you just ran and the output will appear. So the other thing which is cool about these HTML files, if you go to the very top, there's a little drop down button that says code. And here, you, you know, you can hide the code chunks or show them, but you can also download the original RMD file. So this HTML file from the notebook, this is what I would encourage you to like stash away. And if you want to download it from RStudio Cloud onto your computer, you can simply select it by clicking the little checkbox next to it in the files pane and then going to the more button and clicking export okay you don't have to do it right now you could wait till we're done at the end of today but i would encourage you to download your html files from your notebooks when you, you know when you're done with them 
and keep them because this is what you can go back to um, to do this kind of stuff again. Okay, um, to save it as HTML, to save the notebook files HTML, you don't have to do anything special. All you have to do is save the notebook. Hit the save button up in the toolbar or click control S. And every time you do that, it's going to render in the background. It's going to render every, all the work that you've done so far is going to be saved as HTML. And that HTML file will appear in your file pane in the same place as the, as the notebook file, the RMD file. Okay, we'll take, um, let's take, I'll, I'll help you in a second here, Susan. Let's take a um, five minute break. This is a good kind of stopping point. Let's take a 10 minute break because I, I apologize for bleeding into the lunch hour. Um, it's just kind of how the chips fell. Okay, we'll keep going. Uh, yeah, so that's, uh, we, we, we should get through at least one of the more of the, of the notebooks, but I'd like to uh, go back and show some more slides first. Uh, one thing that we, behooves us to work when we're working with climate data is to make sure that we're, work, you know, that we work with it wisely. Um, because with the API, you do have access to the <clears throat> source data, to those daily datas. Um, that kind of opens up, it's kind of like the bumper rails have been lifted. If you go to the CalAdapt website, all of those visualizations and those, you know, there's like a dozen or more of them. They're well designed, but they're kind of built in that you're using climate data the way it's supposed to be used. When you have access to the source data, um, it opens the door to do any kind of stuff with it. So we have to understand a little bit more about, you know, some best practices to work with climate data. So would this be a wise use of climate data? So suppose I'm trying to plan my retirement party. Uh, my accountant tells me I'll be ready to retire by 2070. I'll be 142 by then. But I want to do it in the San Luis Obispo Country Club on a weekend in February. And I can go into the climate models and I can find out when is, when, you know, when it's predicted to rain that month. Um, if you want to see how that's done, you can click on this little box here make this plot and that's the code that generated that plot so but i think everybody knows this is silly right this would be an unwise use of climate data right we can't predict rainfall in one month much less 50 years from now um so clearly that's probably not a good idea so what are some some best practices for um for working with climate data so first of all Remember that climate is basically the average of weather over decades, at least th three decades or more is generally what's recommended, right? So that's what these models are designed for. To get those averages, to get those averages, they have to simulate weather on a daily basis. And the next generation of climate data, climate models will be sub-daily. Uh, but really, they're designed for and they've been validated to do a good job capturing the trends of the climate envelope, right? So the average weather over 20 or 30 years more. So that's what you that's what you should be using the data to get from, even though you can get smaller than that. So if you're not always you need to be using at least 20 to 30 years of data. Um, now, you might get daily metrics, you might be interested in like chill hours or, or you know maybe the number of extreme heat days but you need to be taking taking those daily measures and averaging them over at least 20 to 30 years otherwise you're making kind of probably claims that wouldn't you know that these models weren't designed to to support okay so look at long times of period uh look at multiple models and multiple emission scenarios right so there's 30 global climate models, um, 10 that have been recommended for California. There is some variability among these models. They make different assumptions about how the atmosphere works. They have different assumptions about land cover. Um, so, and we don't, you know, none of, none of them are um, intended or designed to be like, you know, the perfect model, right? So you have to look at multiple of those. Emissions, that's the big wild card. Um, if you, you know, if humanity can get our act together and control emissions or not, um, that is by far the biggest source of uncertainty. So 
when you're looking at future, um, you have to think about emissions. Um, and look, again, look at multiple scenarios. Think about for your use case, you know, what is more dangerous to be optimistic or, um, or not, opti you know, or, or safe. Okay. So aggregate, 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 right? So understanding how these models work, you know, don't just look at a specific location in time or a specific point um, in, in time, you know, if possible, it's better to look at maybe, you know, your averages for a whole county are probably going to be more on the mark than for a specific location, right? So depending what your use case is, you know, think about averaging across space. Um, taking rolling averages is generally a good idea. If you are taking, if you are grabbing climate data for a watershed, for example, you, 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 you have to specify how you're going to spatially aggregate that. Are you going to take the mean? Are you going to take the median? Are you going to take the, the min or the max, right? Because many polygons cover multiple climate um, grid cells. Look at both the central tendency and the range of variability, depending what you're looking at, whether it's precipitation or snowfall or, or humidity, these both can be important, right? So here we see a line series of, what's this, average annual minimum temperature, and we can see the central tendency is definitely going up, but then you also see, if you look at the spread of these, of these lines, that also seems to be enlarging over time, right? So that's important to recognize and to, and to think about. Is that spread because the models diverge over time or is it because that the models predict a greater um, range of annual variability within models? So compare, compare the future against historic conditions, compare places. These are all ways that you can use the models and the insights that these models provide and sound defensible, um, make sound defensible conclusions and not, and not try to um, get in more detail than they're really designed for. Okay, I love this idea of a climate analog. This is quite common now. It's basically, you can use climate data to say, where in California, what city could I go to, to, to look at what my city of Berkeley is going to look like in 50 years. You know, I'm probably going to have to go um, south, perhaps, right? Or, or in a drier place. So that's called a climate analog. And then I can say, okay, in that city, maybe it's Fresno or something, you know, what trees grow there? What are, what are the heat risks people have? So that's called climate analog. Is, um, that's one way you can use these models to um, find similarities and look at things that impacts. So in when you are comparing the past and the future, right, this is pretty common, our infrastructure, our species, our health, our economic systems, our production systems, they've been developed for our historic conditions. So a lot of times people want to say, how are they going to change? So looking, you, and you can get in CALADAP, you can get the observed historical record for temperature or precipitation. It might not, you might think, well, that's the gold standard, right? That's what the weather stations measured. So that should be what I use as the reference point to look at what's going, what's predicted for the future. That's actually not really um, good practice because what's observed and what's what the models predict for the future, they're, they're different things. They're apples and oranges. So the, the observed record, it's a specific set of observed values, actual values, but it's not the climate envelope, you know, and then it's that's one set of temperatures that emerge that or that could have emerged from from the broader climate data. So, so that's actually like a record of weather, whereas what the models are giving us are the envelopes and the general trends in the future. So when you're working with historic, when you do want to do that past to future comparison, it's generally recommended to compare the the same models, the same 10 models have also been run for the past, looking at the actual emission scenarios from the past. So that's modeled historic data and modeled future data. This is generally better practice because you're comparing apples to apples. And the models have been shown to do a really very good job at capturing the climate patterns of the past. Okay. So there's a lot more depth that we could get into, and I'm by no means an expert on that, but be aware that 
uh, when you're working with climate data and you have all the powers you know, to get into any kind of level of detail, um, think about what's, 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 what's a responsible way to use it. Okay, so let's now let's talk about some of the other data sets on Caladap. What we've looked at now have been these kind of the, the, the popular modeled climate layers. Um, but there's more than that, right? And we're going to see all of them. So basically, every Caladap, every data layer, every raster series on the Caladap API has um, information in a catalog that you can see. Um, it's available, a copy, I should say, a copy of the catalog is saved with the package. They, they are frequently changing, adding new layers to it, um, the Caladap team, and will continue to do so. But you can see the name, slug. Slug is an important, the slug is an important um, thing to remember because that's the unique identifier for every raster series available through the Caladap API. So if you can't get it any other way, you can grab it from the slug. Um, and we're gonna, when we go back to the notebook in just a minute, we're going to see, we're actually gonna pull it up and you can, you can see what's, what's there. The last thing I'll do here is before, and again, before we go back to the next notebook, let's talk a little bit more about data wrangling. We've already seen some of that. So data wrangling, you know, this is kind of more general data, data management, data science. So the data that we get back from Caladap, it's always going to be kind of in this flat format, right? So it's going to be a table with roughly eight columns, right? So depending on what you're doing, though, you're probably going to have to manipulate that before you can throw it into a function that plots or before you can throw it into your, your, your you know, impact model. You may have to say, well, I don't need all of these commons, columns, right? So you may have to throw away some columns. Uh, you might get, you may have to filter some of the rows. We've already seen an example where we needed to change the units for a column, right? So that's changing column type or calculating a new column. A lot of times you might, you're interested in summarizing, right? So for each decade, what is the distribution of precipitation values, right? or that kind of thing. You may have to go from this long format to a wide format, again, depending what you're doing. So for all of that kind of data wrangling operations, R has some lovely packages that have been well developed. Uh, the ones I'm showing here, these are all from the tidyverse, so they're newish uh, packages. And we've already seen, we've already worked on some of these, but these are the functions that we'll see again in the next um, notebook, right? Because this is really where a lot of the uh, work is involved. Um, it's not hard getting climate data into Caladapt. Um, into R. You can, you can download it if you want. You can go to the website and get big CSV files. And, you know, it's a little more steps, but it's not that hard. Um, but it's, it's using these functions once you get the tabular data to munge it or wrangle it into the shape that you need. Okay, so um, I'll pause for questions and then we'll go back to the next notebook, notebook number two. And in this notebook, we're going to look at the data catalog uh, we'll see an example of creating an API request object using a slug, right? Because it's 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 an oddball kind of layer. Um, and then we'll do some more visualizations and analyses. Okay, so go back into our studio. And my project went to sleep, so I'm gonna resume my project. Once you get back into our studio, open up notebook number two. All right, so my RStudio cloud has opened. I'm going to close the other notebook I was working on, and I'm going to open up notebook number two. All right. I'm going to go ahead and clear all of the variables that I have in memory just to keep things tidy. So if you would like to do that as well, um, if you go to the environment pane, you'll see a little broom icon if you click that, that will delete all of the objects that you have in memory. Okay. And then maybe just in the spirit of being reproductive, I'm also going to restart my R session. So if you go to the session menu, uh, you can restart R. So this again, this will basically 
um, unload any packages. Um, it's generally good practice. You don't have to, but it's generally good practice when you're working in a notebook to kind of like start with a clean slate. Okay, so notebook number two, I trust everybody has it open. If you haven't, um, please speak up. And let's just jump right into it. Go down, notebook number two, run code chunk number one, which just like the other notebook, it's loading a bunch of libraries. Probably many of these uh, you've seen before. Okay, let's see the output number two. Okay, so the first thing we're gonna do in this notebook is we're going to retrieve some climate data, but not for a single point location, but for an entire county, okay? And we're gonna produce the little graph that you can see in the picture there. So go down to um, code chunk two, chunk number two, and run that line. And as you can see, it's simply a uh, constant, AOI presets underscore type. So this is a constant that comes with the package. And these are the names of the preset areas of interest that you can query climate data from. These are all polygon layers, every one of them. Um, it's, it's things you would expect, congressional districts, climate regions that we use, those are big climate regions, census tracts, and so forth. Okay, um, just as an FYI, if you did want to like maybe make a map of climate, say you want to say you're doing something with census tracts and you want to grab some climate data and you want to make those into a map, you can use this other convenience function called CA underscore AOI preset geome and you put in the name of one of these area of preset areas of interest and it will return a polygon layer as a simple feature data frame that you can then join to your climate data and make a you know, color the census tracts based on um, a climate variable. Oh, do I mind sharing the link to the notebook again? Um, so the notebook is in the project, um, the RStudio project, and I'll put that, R, I'll put a link to the RStudio project in the chat window. Uh, Yes. Um, if you're on, yeah, I would say use R Studio Cloud at this point. Um, if you want to use R Studio Desktop, if you go to the computer setup page on the workshop site, uh, there's a link to um, a command you can use to download the data to R Studio Desktop. Okay. Okay. So we our our goal here is to get climate data for Kings County. So we don't have to give it a polygon for Kings County, which is nice, but we do have to give it an ID value because there's a lot of counties. So we have to give it um, a unique ID value. And the one we're gonna give it is the FIPS code. So if every county in the country has a unique FIPS code. Um, if, I don't know which government agency assigns those. Um, unfortunately, there are multiple Kings counties. There's some, there's a few counties in Nevada. There are counties in Nevada that have the same names as county in California. So the name is not unique. So that's why we have to do FIPS code. So if you want to see what the FIPS codes are, you can run chunk number three. Uh, I'm just gonna blow past this because finding FIPS code, I don't want you to, I don't want to spend our workshop time trying to find a FIPS code. For Kings County, it's it's given to you down below. Um, if you do chunk number four, actually this is worth run chunk number four. Now chunk number four, there's one command in there and it's commented out. So go ahead and run it. Either remove that comment or highlight the line without the comment and hit Control Enter. And what that's going to do, it's going to open up the. Uh, county's simple feature data frame, the attribute table for it. Again, this is coming from the Caladap server. And these, these are all of the features. We can make a map out of this if we wanted to just plot that function. 
Um, but you can see here the FIPS code for the county. So this would be one way to find the FIPS code for a county that you are interested in. Okay, it's a character value. And a lot of them start with zero. Okay, so let me clear my litter catch. Let's keep doing this error. Okay, but I'm down below you are told the FIPS code for Kings County at 06031. Again, that's a character, not a number. So come down to chunk number five, and we are using that FIPS code in a, to build an API request object. So run chunk number five in notebook number two. Um, chunk number five also includes the pre-flight function, right? So we're verifying that the API request object is complete. So if you look at the API request object that we construct in chunk number five, most of it looks familiar. You can see that the first function there is different than before. We're using a function that allows us to pass in the name of one of the preset areas of interest. That's type equals counties a field from the, that attribute table, the FIPS column, and then the actual value of the features. This is, these are polygon features that we want. And you can, of course, make an API request object for, for multiple features. Okay, so that's a little bit different. The other thing that's different in this API request object is the very last function that's part of this API request object, which is CA underscore options. So you'll see that in chunk number five. And this is where we are specifying, we're telling it that we want to take the, the maximum. So Kings County covers more than just um, one grid cell. Right? There's gonna be a bunch of them. So, and we only want one value for the whole county. So we have to tell it, how do we want it to aggregate all of those um, climate values across the county. And here we're specifying max. Max is a little unusual. Usually you, you we use mean, but um, depending on the use case, you might use max. We'll go with max right now. Okay, any questions? Okay, come down to chunk number six. Scroll down to chunk number six and run it. And you should see the uh, map of the county with the grid cells overlaid on top of it. So those are the grid cells that will, will be queried. And then we're gonna take the maximum value um, for, each, for each time period, which uh, is years, um, and return a value. Okay, now we have a good API request object. We can fetch some data. Go down to chunk number seven and run chunk number seven. And you can see it's uh, getting values back from the server. And you can see what it looks like. So each row here represents one year, one GCM, one emission scenario um, and one one variable, one climate variable that has been. Okay, any questions? All right, so we just finished, we successfully imported some data for all of Kings County um, for this set of years. Okay. Next, uh, go down to chunk number eight, where again we're working towards making that time series plot. So if you look at chunk number eight, but the time series plot, we're not just plotting the actual values, we're plotting the difference between RCP 8.5 and RCP 4.5. So 8.5, that's the higher emission scenario. So when it comes to temperature, it usually generates higher temperatures because there's more emission, there's more carbon in the atmosphere. And our goal here is to plot that difference between those two emission scenarios. So it's a little bit different. So if you look at the chunk number eight, go ahead and run chunk number eight if you haven't already. 
Uh, we're using the mutate function. We saw that before. We're adding a column for the temperature in Fahrenheit. We're using the select function to pick out just a few of the columns. We don't need all of these columns. So that's what the select function is doing. And then we're using pivot wider. Pivot wider is a function from the tidy R package. And we're using that to split out the temperatures for RCP 4.5 and RCP 8.5. So if you look at the output there, those are now in separate columns. Previously, they were all in one column, the vowel column, but now we've split them out. Which we want to do that because we want to take the, uh, we want to subtract them. Any questions? Can you get temperature units other than Kelvin? So you can't control what Caladapt server gets sends back to you, but you can you can convert them to other things. Actually, that's not true. You can specify in the API request um, the units that you want, imperial or metric, um, but that's not built into the functions in this R package because it's pretty easy to change units. Okay, come down to chunk number nine. Run chunk number nine, and you should see the plot. Um, again, we're using ggplot. Um, every time I make ggplot, I have to start with Google, so I'm not an expert on it. But what, I, what you can see here is that uh, we've added a geome smooth. So that's a really nice thing that you can do with ggplot. It's basically a trend line, right? Um, and you can see it there. It's, it's, it's overlaying the trend line, including the little 95% um, confidence of people. ggplot's a nice full package. Okay. Keep going. So again, that's just some more creative munging and use of ggplot. Any questions? Okay, don't worry if you don't understand everything. Um, I certainly don't, but I always, you know, I save it. And then when I need to do something like this again, I go back to it and, um, and adapt. Let's go to part two of this notebook. We're still on notebook number two. Scroll down to chunk number 10. This line is commented out, but basically, so simply highlight everything except for that comment character and hit enter. And what's it, what it's basically doing is we're taking the Caladat data catalog, that's what it's called, which is returned by that CA underscore catalog underscore RS function, feeding that into the view function, which is an RStudio function, and that opens it up in a another pane. So here you can see the entire catalog. You can see the, the names, the slug. Remember the slug I was telling you? That's, that's a sure fire way to specify a Caladat data layer. Everyone has a unique slug. And then there's some additional columns if you're interested. There's the URL. Um, you can click on those to go, go to the page on the Caladat website. The time period. You know, that raster series has values for the number of rasters it contains um, and so on and so forth all right so let's say you are interested in say snow right and you're and so one way that you can find layers from caladap that you're interested in is to open up this catalog in the view pane as we've just done and then click on the little filter button up at the top. You see that little filter button on the top of the pane? Click there, and now you can do some searching. So for example, if I'm interested in snow, I can go to the name column and then type the word snow in, and, and it's, now it's, it's uh, filtered the results to um, those raster layers that have the word snow in the name. So some of these I recognize. Um, there might be some other ones I don't recognize, but you know, you can kind of go down and find the one that you're interested in and then grab the slug. Okay, so that's one way that you can find stuff. Um, you can also search on the slug, right? So SWE stands for snow water equivalent. I just know that from experience. So if I type SWE in the filter box for the slug columns, I can see all of the raster series that are for snow water equivalent. 
Uh, Libni is another one. Libni is the data set which is the observed historical values. So if you're interested in observed historical values, go to the slug box and type in Libni, and you can see what's there. Of course, I have to spell it right. Okay, so that's one way that you can find data sets. Okay, the next challenge is how many raster series data sets are there? Well, we just saw it. Um, but if you wanted to type a expression that would return the number of raster data sets in the catalog, you can simply say CA underscore catalog underscore RS. So that function returns a data frame. It's just a regular data frame. And then you could feed that into maybe n row. Right, is a function that returns the number of rows in a data frame. Um, that'd be one way to do it. Okay, questions? Excellent, let's keep going. Go down to chunk number 12. Chunk number 12, go ahead and run that. This is another way that you can find data sets from the catalog. There is a search function that is built into the package. It's called CA underscore catalog underscore search. And then you feed it the, you know, a string. Um, that could be a slug, in which case you'll get information back about just that layer. It could be a more generic thing, like maybe snow. I'll run that. And then that's going to return information, a list of all of the layers that have the word snow, either in the name of it or the slug, um, and so on and so forth. So you can use this catalog search function from the package to get information about a specific raster series. You might want to know what are the dates it's available for, or to help you find data sets that you're interested in. Okay, so that's kind of a convenient function. You can also go to the Caladap website. They have other tools for finding data sets. Uh, but there's a lot, so you can do some of this more. All right. Okay, go down to um, chunk number 13. This is a challenge. And I'll pause for one minute. See if you, yeah, I'll pause for a couple, let me pause for a couple minutes. Type in an expression here that will return data sets, the number of data sets from GridMet. So GridMet is a source of climate data, of observed, historical, rasterized, interpolated climate layers. Right? It's one of the newer data sets in the Caladap API. So type an expression there that will return data sets from, from GridNet. All right, let me give this a shot here. Well, let me start with the CA catalog, catalog search. And let's see, GridNet, I don't know if it's case sensitive or not. But I'm just gonna take in lowercase. And I got a bunch of them. All right, so if I want the number of those, let's see what I can do. Maybe, maybe length. Yeah, that seemed to work. Okay, so anyway, that's how you can find layers. Okay, let's keep going. Um, okay, so as we move down, we can Next, we're going to create an API request that isn't going to specify the global climate model and the emissions scenario and the climate variables. We're going to get one that's for, for a specific slug, right? So some of the layers um, that aren't model climate data, um, you can grab them with the slug. So challenge number three, what is the raster data set with, I've given you a slug, it's called TMMN underscore day underscore gridnet. So if you wanna say, okay, like 
what is this layer? You can use the CA catalog search or yeah, a search function, feed it the slug, and it'll specify. I can see this is daily data. It's um, minimum temperature, daily minimum temperature for the time period 1979 to 2020. I can see that it's going to give me units in Kelvin and so on and so forth. Right? So that's what this layer is. So if that, need, if that meets my needs, I can query it. Okay. Um, very good. Okay, so let's move down and keep going. Go down to chunk number 15. And what we're going to do in the rest of this notebook is some more data wrangling and visualization to show some other ways that you can um, manipulate climate data that you get back. So chunk number 15, go ahead and run chunk number 15, score down there. And as you can see, it is, um, uh, we're creating an API request for future maximum daily temperature data. Notice that the period here is day. So we're not asking Caladap to average these daily temperatures for us. We're going to get a lot more records back um, because we're asking it for daily temperature values, two emission scenarios, and four GCMs, and 20 years of data. OK, if you run chunk number 16, it shows the location that we are querying. This is Lynn Cove Research Extension Center. It's one of the field stations in the UC Ag and Natural Resources Division. They do lots of citrus research. It's a lovely place. Come down to chunk number 17. Chunk number 17, we're going to fetch some data. And the dim function, so that should, should go pretty quick, um, even though we're getting a lot of data. Uh, the dim function tells you the number of rows and columns. So we just got back 58,000 rows. And then the head function shows the first six rows of this table, the first six of 54,000. And we can see we've gotten back for every, if you look at the DT column, you can see this is you know, um, January 1st, January 2nd, January 3rd, so forth. Um, so this is daily data, um, again, maximum daily temperature. Mm -hmm. Come down to chunk number 18. And what we're trying to do here in chunk number 18 is we want to create, as you can see, the our goal here is to make a box plot. So for every month, um, so we're interested in, you know, how is temperature over the calendar season? Right? Because this is a, they're growing citrus there. So um, citrus trees have a range of temperatures that they can withstand. So we're going to group all of this daily temperature by the month, like January, February, and so forth. So what we're doing here in chunk number 18 is you can see that mutate function, it's creating two columns. We're creating the Fahrenheit column as we've done before, but we're also creating a column for the month and a column for the year using functions from Lubridate. So Lubridate is another package um, in the tidyverse. Okay, so that's what it looks like. And then come down to chunk number 19. And I wouldn't expect anybody to write chunk number 19 from scratch, uh, but it's a ggplot function. And you can see that we're using the box plot geome. We're also using facet grid, which is basically telling it to take slices of the data um, with unique combinations of scenario. And anyway, so what we get though is going to be for each of the two emission scenarios, we're getting 
box plots of the daily temp the maximum daily temperature for each month. Okay, so that's what chunk number 19 gives us. Keep going down. Something else that is common when you're looking at temperature data is people are concerned about extreme heat. So when the temperature is above a certain point. So in chunk number 20, we are basically um, going to uh, identify which of the days in this in, of the 58,000 days we just got, which of them count as extreme heat where we are defining extreme heat to be over 105 degrees Fahrenheit. Right, so that's what chunk number 20 does. Go ahead and run that. And if you scroll over in the output, scroll to the, to the right, you can see a new column at the end there called really hot. That's true or false. So that day is over, if the maximum temperature is over 105, those values will be true. So that's the column we just created in chunk number 20. Chunk number 21, Go ahead and run that. We're not making a plot here, but we're using group by, which is a function from dplyr, to for every mission scenario, count up the number of rows or the number of days um, where really hot is, is true or false. And then if you keep going down to chunk number 22, it's the same thing. We're just um, formatting it to look a little easier. So we can see that if you look at how many hot days there are in RCP 4.5, it's 2,800. In RCP 8.5, it's 5,000. So you get more extreme heat days in RCP 8.5 and RCP 4.5 for this time period at the end of the century. Okay. So even if that's not something you'd be interested in, the point is with enough endurance and persistence, you can write relatively short expressions to work this climate data to answer questions you're interested in. And there are other notebooks on the Teladec R website um, that have more examples of this. Okay, so on challenge number four, basically, I think we're going to skip this. I want to wind down and open up for questions. Maybe let people go if they're getting fatigued. So challenge number four, um, basically the same thing, but use 110 degrees Fahrenheit as your threshold. Uh, if you do want to see like how many, how to find heat spells. So heat spell is where the temperature is over a threshold for two, three, four days in a row. Um, there's a link, there's a notebook on the CalDEP website, or there's a link that you can click on um, which illustrates that. It's not, that's not hard to do in R. Okay, finally, chunk number 24. What this is going to do, now we're going to look at the, the final plot that we're going to make in this notebook. We're going to look at the historic precipitation data, and we're going to create histograms because precipitation data under most climate change scenario uh, doesn't go up or down dramatically, but the, the variability does change with climate change. That's kind of a, a big pattern for, for precipitation. So this is kind of exploring some of that. So if you run chunk number 24, look what, if you look closely at chunk number 24, we're grabbing data from Livni. So Livni is a data set on Caladap, which is historic um, data. Observed historic data, not model, but actual, you know, from weather stations with interpolation. And we're telling it, give us precipitation on a daily basis from 1950 to 2009. So we create that API request in code chunk number four, again for the Lincove location, and then run chunk number 25. We're basically feeding that API request. We're getting data from Caladapt. And let's see how many we have 21,000, almost 22,000 rows, right? So again, that's about 30 years of data times daily. So that's about right. 
Um, there's no GCMs here. It's, if you look at the table, um, as you can see, you've got the climate variable, the period, and the slug, right? You know, there's no GCM, there's no emission scenario, because again, this is living, so this is observed historic data. So those columns don't appear. Um, chunk number, uh, we're also seeing, um, uh, we're seeing the, the values have been renamed to millimeters per day. Right? So the Livni data, the units are millimeters for precipitation. Okay, finally run chunk number 26. And you'll see a bunch of histograms, one for each decade. So to get these histograms, we create a column in the table for decade. So you can see that in the mutate function in chunk number 26. There's a mutate function there that's adding that column for the decade. And then that's being fed into ggplot, as usual, to generate a series of histograms, um, the precipitation values are getting logged because they're bunched up. So that logging spits it up. Anyway, this may or may not be useful, but again, it's to illustrate that you can do a lot with the climate data once you get it done. Okay, any questions? Go ahead and save your notebook so that it generates the HTML version of it. Um, and let me finish up with just a couple slides and then we'll stop. Okay, okay, shiny apps. All right, so I'm back at the slide deck. I'm just going to take the last five minutes to show some other stuff that you can do. We're not going to have time to do any more notebooks. Um, but shiny apps, so shiny is an R package and it allows you to, I'm going to click on one of these. Um, it allows you to create lightweight web apps that are running R in the background. So that's one way that you can help your users, your audience, who probably aren't R users, or even yourself, um, to get climate data. So that's a whole nother workshop to learn. I just clicked on one of the sample Shiny apps that I have online. This particular one, um, I'm just going to pick a location. So this particular one is going to return the chill portions that are projected to happen under climate change. So chill portions, that's basically, it's a measure of the total amount of coldness that you get in the winter season. And you might wonder, like, why would anybody care about that? It's really, really important to tree crop growers. The trees don't have enough, they need a certain amount of chill to come out of their dormancy, basically. So if you don't have enough chill, then you're not going to get a good harvest. The tree crops are worried. That's, you know, that's climate change. So anyway, so if you go down, if you open up that one and then click on it, basically it's doing a lot of calculations. It's grabbing the temperature values. It's computing how many chill hours um, you might get. And then it's going to spit out some, some charts when it's finished. So it's an easy to use, it's a simple website. Um, anyway, you can build these with, with, with R. There's a, another R package called Caladapter Apps that has these, uh, some, some of some sample shiny apps. Okay. If you're interested in that, let me know, I can, I can help you out. Um, there's a notebook there. Yeah, lastly, um, you know, the, for learning more about working with Caladapt data or this R package, uh, go to the website. That's uh, it's got some extra menu items that has links to this stuff. Um, some stuff that I'm working on right now, and I love collaborators. Um, I'm developing an ebook of code recipes, uh, just trying to mix and match the different stuff uh, as, as a resource for people working with climate data. I've got another R package that calculates degree days. Within agriculture, degree days is a helpful metric. It predicts when different things are going to happen. It predicts when you're, you know, how, how quickly your nuts are going to develop, like when they might be vulnerable to pests. It predicts when the pests are going to be um, laying their eggs or coming out hungry, right? 
Um, I'm working on developing some other packages to query weather data, like the current weather data, um, and so on and so forth. But I love this stuff, as you can probably tell. I enjoy playing with R. Climate data is really, really important. So if any of you have uh, questions or use cases and would like to chat about them, please let me know. Um, I'd love to find out more, and maybe we could work together to come up with some code and solve your problems. All right, I will stop there.